Welcome to On the Bubble Podcast, episode 38. I'm your host, Vasa J. Weida, and with me is my co-host, Yuki Lee Bender. And today we actually have a special guest on our pod. We have Yichin and Oliver from OKNY, and they're here to explain their cube and basically answer any questions we have about the cube today. Let's start with, uh, if you guys can introduce yourself, Oliver and Yichin. Uh, sure, I'll go ahead and start. Um, my name is Yichin. I am a level two judge. I am famous, famously the person who is least seen playing amongst all of our locals. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. My name's Oliver. I play Fab. I'm almost, I'm hopefully going to be a level two judge soon, but we'll see about that. Yeah, it's depending on how I feel, basically. Oh, you have the power? Yeah, basically how it works is that when, if you want to be a level two judge, you have to do all the prerequisites. And then after that, you have to get a recommendation from a level two judge or higher. So uh, he is basically defaulting to me as his judge mentor. And as a result, I have complete power over him. That's so sick. In Vancouver, <laughs> we don't have anybody that's a level two judge. So we're just stuck with all level one judges in our area. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of an issue for sure. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your podcast as well? Um, or like your your channel, I guess? Sure. Um, Oliver, you can go. You can do their spiel. Uh, we occasionally record podcasts and we just upload a lot of games because <laughs> the plan was to do podcasts. And then uh, in the downtime, I was like, let's just upload some gameplay. And then it just took off from there. So we're just known for gameplay now, even though we have podcasts in our name. Yeah, we are not actually a podcast podcast. Yeah, if you guys are ever, if our listeners are ever looking for gameplay, you can check out OKNY. We'll, we'll let you guys plug your socials and stuff later. But yeah, they're they're an awesome resource for, for gameplay and also Cube, which we're going to be diving into today. So we've talked a little bit about Cube on the podcast, but also um, I know that like some of our listeners may have missed those episodes. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, just what what is a cube in flesh and blood what does what does that mean yeah so a cube is basically a custom draft format the name cube comes from magic where um it's a really long origin story but basically um, a bunch of people decided that they wanted to have a custom draft format where it was just a bunch of their favorite cards and jam some games with that um that kind of mutated to its own format in magic and since then uh there's been a small contingency of people that have been trying to export cubes to other games. And so I just happen to be uh, one of the people who has been basically pioneering. I don't want to be you know, super arrogant about it, but we've been um, some of the few people that have been working on making custom draft formats for Flesh and Blood. So, and just, just to clarify for any listeners, so it, we, we are using traditional Flesh and Blood cards, but the... I guess like the combinations that are available to draft are not necessarily like in line with the sets they were released in. Like we might combine from like lots of different sets. Okay. Since I think at this point, like you mentioned, it's kind of hasn't really like it has some roots in magic and some people might have played magic cube, but I think flesh and blood cube at this point is is pretty novel. Not that many people have really had the opportunity to try it. So for anybody who might be kind of, um, you know, unfamiliar with Cube, why why should they try it? Why should they pick it up? What what makes Cube enjoyable? Um, if you're trying to like sell sell a friend on it, what would you tell them about Cube? Uh, what, what makes Cube so great? Oh, well, there's a good amount of reasons why you might want to try Cube. Um, from a Magic player's perspective, which is what I came from, um, the draw for a cube is that you get to play with a limited set using more um, more cards and more interesting cards than you normally would um so for a lot of you know other cubes it might be oh i get to play with all these majestics or all these you know super rare cards all these super powerful cards in one set and have these super highly tuned limited decks and play with them have some fun with playing with other people with similar power decks from a designer's perspective, which is also what I kind of have an affinity for, um, you get to design your own draft format and you get to see how these cards that might not see play otherwise or might not see play with, with each other otherwise um, get to interact with each other and discover some cool you know, decks and deck types that otherwise might not have a 
chance to shine in normal classic constructed blitz or whatever play yeah absolutely it's really a cool way to showcase the cards and get to play um like you said some like higher power limited decks that like compared to what you're used to in a typical draw format so from what i understand you have two cubes right now is that right yes we are working on a couple more but in terms of stuff that's like released to the public we have two main cubes one of which is our midwinter cube that is a traditional eight person draft where you can draft either ranger or wizard or ice versions of each ranger and wizard so uh, azalea lexi icelander and kano and we also have a smaller more 1v1 environment called bento box where you basically get to draft ninja and play against other ninjas and play a bunch of mirrors it doesn't sound fun but uh, it it is pretty fun (laughs) Yeah, I can attest to this. I think that Jay's drafted Midwinter Cube with you guys, and I have as well, and that was a lot of fun. But you do need, you do kind of need, do you always need eight people, or does it does it work okay with six as well? Um, we actually haven't tested it with six. I don't think there would be too much of an issue with six, but it's going to be similar to other you know normal draft formats where if you have six people for WTR, it's not going to be as fun as if you have eight, where... Some, some person is just going to get all of one hero's cards, right? Yeah, especially with the four heroes, it sort of like distributes the classes a little bit more evenly. Mm-hmm. And um, you just get to see more cards. So the decks are a little bit more powerful because you have access to like, even though you're always picking 45 cards, like when there's eight packs instead of six packs that you get to see, you just see more cards and get to make more choices. Very cool. So... If you had to like recommend these cubes to somebody, like maybe they're just wanting to get into cube, how might they decide between building like the the bento box cube or building the midwinter cube? What might be some of the trade offs there? Maybe Oliver, do you have any thoughts about this? Just to start off, I think you would. I think building the bento box is pretty easy. It, we try to make it relatively cheap, so put it in TCG player, and it was like fifty ish bucks. For fifty bucks to, to get a two player draft format on the table. I think a lot of our friends have done that and really enjoyed it. So if you want to try it out, then Bento Box is probably the way. If you have more friends available and you have the time to put together a 360 card cube, then the Midwinter Cube is probably the way to go. Some of the classes in the Midwinter Cube are kind of difficult to play, like Kano. So that's kind of what we're working on in the future is like getting a cube that has like more new player friendly or more, more wider audience rather. So um, do know that the Midwinter Cube is a little bit more advanced when you're trying to draft and assemble a good deck. I just want to say for the winter, the Midwinter Cube, I played that at Worlds with you guys last time. I think it was quite difficult even for the people that was playing at Worlds at some of the interactions that could happen in the Midwinter Cube. Like typically the Icelander versus Kano matchups were like pretty crazy on what pe- either player can do. And the other thing I just wanted to point out was the uh, Midwinter Cube quite expensive to build nowadays, right? Because it has New Horizons, and doesn't it also have Storm Striders in it? Uh, no. no, no New Horizons, no Storm Striders. Uh, we actually specifically excluded those cards, um, partly because of the price and partly because they are a little bit too like obvious picks. Uh, we do have two copies of Skullbone Crosswrap though, which are now much more pricey than before. Yeah, we got them when they're like forty-ish bucks, but. The most expensive card right now is Tunic. Obviously, you don't need to have Tunic in the cube, but it's just to show like Legendaries isn't everything. So we can still have Legendaries in the cube and still have it mid to high power. Yeah. And one thing to keep in mind, especially with uh, if you're going to build these cubes on your own, is that you don't have to do what we do. A lot of our cubes and the later updates of those cubes are tailored towards our own experiences and our playtesters' experiences with the cube. So... You should expect that you will deviate from our cube at some point, and that's totally fine. A cube is a personal experience, and it's something that, as a cube creator, you want to kind of have your own personal touch for. So it's not just, you know, you don't have to follow our recipes exactly. You can go completely off and build your own cubes and build your own draft formats. That's totally fine. We just kind of start off creating these as a proof of concept, and we encourage people to experiment and play around and see what works. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for any listeners out there, if 
you're wanting to try these cubes and it's a little bit on the pricey side and there's like a couple of those cards like the skull bone cross wrap or the tunic just pick another head equipment you know put in an extra honing hood for the and then for chest piece maybe put in like a deep blue or something like just you can come up with alternatives that won't be exactly the same but will still be totally serviceable and i've i've done this a bit myself uh, when putting together the bento box i couldn't find i was too lazy to find rapid reflex so i just put in another razor reflex instead (laughs) too strong too high power (laughs) i'm just kidding it's fine yeah eventually it becomes a sort of a sort of ship of theseus right where you can replace as many cards as you want and at some point it stops being our cube and just starts being your cube Right. So if people are looking for information on, let's say, the cards in these cubes, um, where where can they go? Yeah, so we have a couple of options. We have our own channel, which um, Oliver can, you know, plug. I have a couple of Reddit posts that will go into the design philosophy behind each cube and go into a couple of the draft formats. So if you want to take a look, you can take a look at the Reddit posts that I assume will be linked down in the, in the description. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but obviously, if you just pl- um, ping me on the main Discord, I can just answer any questions you have there. What's your username? Uh, Mal Zenith. And how do you spell that? M A L Z E N I T H. Nice, thanks. I'll ping you right now. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. You can always ping uh, Yu Chin if you have questions, and um, and yeah, we'll have those we'll have those links ready to go so that you can view the card list and take a look at them for yourselves. Okay, so in terms of um, the actual draft process, so the Midwinter Cube functions just like a regular draft, pretty much. You have like your fifteen card, three fifteen card packs. You pass to the left, then the right, then the left, and you take one card each pack. Is there anything special that people would need to keep in mind when building the packs for that cube, or do you just shuffle it up and deal fifteen card packs? Yeah, so we have a spreadsheet that kind of outlines what goes in each slot of those packs but we tried to mirror the flesh and blood draft pack as closely as possible when making this cube initially because we figure for a first cube people won't be too interested in trying something that's completely out there so might as well give people something familiar give people something that is easy to understand and once you learn the format it's pretty easy to read uh, what's in each pack how it works is that we divide each of our card or each of the cards in the cube into various piles and then we just take a couple cards from each pile based off of the our spreadsheet and we create packs like that um, oliver has this whole process that he can probably go into a bit more um, but basically we want to mimic draft packs as closely as possible so there's always going to be a guaranteed you know equipment slot some number of ranger and wizard cards and you know just make sh- making sure that there's enough cards in the pool to have enough uh, to make packs somewhat balanced and make sure there's enough picks for everybody. Yeah, I think we mentioned this in our Midwinter Cube uh, podcast episode, but uh, we wanted to make it like 60 to 70% playable for every hero in the in the booster pack. So in the breakdown of each booster pack, kind of like how it is in Flesh and Blood, there's like three to four generic slots. There's the one equipment, the one foil, which is what we have a wild card. And the two rare pluses are rare and then rare plus slots. And then the uh, the class cards, um, that just makes it a more consistent pack overall. And then, yeah, hopefully, and also a good drafting experience. That makes a lot of sense, and I think especially because of how Flesh and Blood is set up, where you're kind of restricted on the types of cards you can put in your deck. You don't you don't want to get a pack that just has no playable cards for you. So that makes a lot of sense. Have you guys tried playing with the uh, just like shuffling up all the cards and then? doing it that way before or have you guys not even tested that yet we actually haven't really tested it i don't think there will be too many issues especially with eight players because you'll still use all the cards in the pack you just might have a couple of weirder picks where you might have like five ranger cards in the pack and like zero wizard cards and you're just like okay i just i guess i just pick a bunch of generic i see i see because like i i can already see if i was playing with my regular like cube group kind of thing they'll be way too lazy to pull up a spreadsheet and they'll just shuffle it up and deal anyway so (laughs) oh yeah definitely uh it's something that magic players aren't actually accustomed to but for flesh and blood players especially with the recent uh issues with uh, outsiders collation 
you can tell that a lot of Flesh and Blood players like the structure of having a guaranteed number of cards in each pack to read signals. Might as well give them what they want and make sure that, you know, everybody's happy. I didn't, that's one thing I didn't like Outsiders is that the Belgian packs are just very, very inconsistent with the number of playables in the packs. But the Japanese packs are a lot more consistent, so it does give a different draft experience. I was going to say exactly that. You could probably try it, but it might be like drafting Belgian packs. <laughs> yeah. Which is to say you could absolutely try it, you know? Like, Cube is all about having fun and if yeah it's all about experimentation wait wait hot take i like belgian packs better than japanese packs (laughs) you get so then maybe shuffling and dealing is the way to go for you jay you get you get to play riptide almost every time with belgian packs (laughs) (laughs) is that true uh we had the in the sorry for our rtns this weekend we were playing with japanese packs for some reason when we had belgian packs the whole time and I feel like the Riptide picks were much harder to do with the Japanese packs than than with the Belgian packs. I ended up just on Ninja on like all five of my drafts. Yeah, I actually haven't drafted Outsiders yet, so that's going to be interesting playing it this weekend. Wait, you're go- you guys are going into Outsiders draft with zero draft? Each in this. I am. I because I because I I'm the judge, so I get to run all the drafts. I don't actually play. I have like six XP in my profile for ninety day XP. So <laughs> I, I I am involved in the game a lot, but I don't actually get to play that much. Wow, that's crazy to me. How about how about you, Oliver? Do you have a bunch of drafts under your belt? Yes, I've drafted it outsiders a bunch. I don't like the draft format. I thought it'd be a, a better since considering uh that I play Ranger and I like the flexibility of uh playing ranger ninja assassin and everything but just like the the pack collection is just what kills it for me honestly Mm, that's fair that's fair so okay so we've kind of talked about the midwinter cube and sort of that drafting experience can you maybe give our listeners a quick kind of rundown of some of your maybe your favorite ways to draft the the bento box there's um i know that there's a variety of of ways but maybe pick uh maybe each of you describe your own favorite way and yeah so uh, i guess we're shifting gears into the bento box so like i said it's a 90 card set of cards so it's not drafted like a normal person or what people would normally think of when they think of draft. We have four different ways listed. Personally, I prefer Houseman Draft, which functions similarly to Mahjong. Uh, how it works is that you have five cards laid out between two players that are face up, and then each player draws a hand of five cards. And then starting from one player, they can swap a card in their hand with a card in the river. Uh, And that will go back and forth three times until both players have made three swaps. They'll take the five cards, add them to their pool, and then the five cards in the river will be um, gone and shuffled back into the next, you know, to the last few hands. So it's an interesting format. The way it's drafted is a lot about revealing information as late as possible. So, for example, if you have a good... Uh, hand which has like surging strike, whelming gust wave, and I don't know, like a couple of other like be like waters or something. You want to hold on and not reveal that you're going for the surging strike line as late as possible until your opponent can't deny you any picks or might actually feed you some extra cards for that. So uh, I prefer drafts with a lot of hidden information. So that's just my favorite way to draft. Um, I know Oliver does not. So he prefers the other way, which I think is the way that you guys mostly played it. So my preferred way of drafting the bento box is uh, quilt drafting. So what happens is that you have a 7x7 seven seven grid of alternating cards. Sorry, 7x7 seven seven grid of cards with alternating uh, rotations. So some every other card will be rotated horizontally. What happens is you'll take turns picking cards, but you can only pick cards whose short side is exposed. So... Initially, like only the outside edges are exposed and only half of those. But as you work your way into the middle, more and more cards will be exposed. And it kind of turns into like hate drafting is also a good strategy while trying to build your own deck and kind of turns into like a mini game. Like you're trying to think five steps ahead, including your opponents. So yeah, you will draft until there are eight cards left in the the quilt. And then you uh, shovel, you burn those cards 
and then shuffle it back into the, the deck, and then you do another 49 card quilt, and then you draft until there's eight cards left. So it sounds complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. Essentially, you basically you have a whole grid of face up cards, and whenever you pick a card, your opponent has more options of like what to pick. So uh, every time you pick a card, you're also trying to deny your opponent the ability to make good picks as well. So it's an interesting back and forth where both players will be trying to build their own decks and have to, you know, kind of hate on their opponent and trying to make sure that their opponent doesn't build a great deck as well. Yeah, this is probably up Jay's alley because it doesn't require any pack building. It's just shuffle and deal. Yeah, the bento box sounds like a lot of fun. I do really want to try it, but we just haven't had a day where we can try it, really. Yeah, it's just how it's happened. But I'm, I've been so... I've been bringing the bento box to most events. I think like for me, I really enjoy the bento box because like sometimes it's hard to get together eight people to draft, like just scheduling it is a lot, but having like two people and something you can shuffle up and play is really nice. And if you, you know, like um, for example, I brought it to RTN and I didn't end up using it, but you know, sometimes you're there hanging out with with a friend and someone somebody you knows in top eight and you have some time to kill and just you know having something that you can play with two people is is really really fun so i think bento box is really really great for that and yeah it's sort of interesting how like i find like different people have different approaches i've had people where they hate draft a lot and both of our decks are like a lot worse and then i've also had people where we kind of like okay let's cooperate and both of our decks are like pretty sick so the philosophy behind um, building the Demento Box in the first place came from Duplicate Sealed in Magic, where in order to do well, you had to understand what your opponent was trying to do and build your deck around that. So it's nice to see that carry over so cleanly in Flesh and Blood, where if you have a pool of cards that both players want and both players want to play, it's interesting to see how these picks will change based on who you're facing. Yeah, and I guess because it's all ninja, it's like, even if you're hate drafting a card that's better in their deck, it's not like you can't put that card in your deck as well. Yeah, ninja is really good for this, especially because it has a lot of medium good cards where there's cards that are just like, okay, like blue block threes are just okay in almost every ninja deck, right? That cause zero. Mm. So there's always ways that there's always reasons to hate draft and we want to, we wanted to make sure that there are good reasons to hate draft oh okay so the so the hate drafting was like part of you had that in mind when you designed the cube yeah yeah well um kind of i definitely had it in mind when designing the drafts um uh, but i know oliver actually likes hate drafting even though he shouldn't in normal draft so I might as well draft. make something that you know he likes i don't do it all the time yeah, but you'd like doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I just pick the shiny cards most of the time. Oh, I do that too. Oh, if it's worth three dollars, it's not yeah. getting past me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that can be counted as hate drafting. That was me in college. Oh, this card's worth two dollars. That's like one tenth of a draft. I'll do it. J will draft cards worth like fifty cents. <laughs> oh yeah, easy fifty cents. Uh, we'll pick it. This does not get past <laughs> me. And maybe one last question about the bento box here is um, if somebody's looking to play shuffle up and play bento box, um, how long of a time commitment is that? I imagine it's different depending. I haven't actually done the, was it the houseman draft? I haven't done that one. Yeah. So time commitment and portability were some of the main reasons we went into the, uh, the main design goals of the bento box in the first place. I would say if you're both experienced, you can probably get a draft done in 10 minutes, and then you can shuffle up and play five minutes after that. If you're not familiar with the draft, it will depend on the type of draft you're doing. But overall, I'd say maximum 30 minutes, and then you play a couple a couple round, a couple quick games. So I'd say like yeah. an hour, an hour and a half at most. So I actually did time this. So I played with a couple of locals. Uh, the first time was around like 50-ish minutes to get a quilt, quilt draft done. But once he was familiar with the pool, and obviously I'm pretty familiar with the pool, we did like a cold draft in about 30 minutes. I also played Winston draft with Yuki at the calling during in the downtime between rounds. So the way we have this is that you build, you draft your decks and then you do a best of three because if you like spend 20 minutes drafting, then 10 minutes playing, there's really no reason to, or like it doesn't, doesn't feel fulfilling to do that. So that's why we suggested best of three. 
Uh, we did two rounds and drafted within like 30 minutes of Winston drafting. So you can probably get it done in like 40-ish minutes with both people familiar. And then I also played a Clay, well, one of Yuki's locals during the calling. So instead of playing our actual round, we played Bento Box. And we finished in around 40-ish minutes. Like he was reading every single card. We did a cult draft. Uh, he was reading every single card. We did the best of three and uh, put an hour, uh, dedicate an hour to this the first time. Then as you guys get faster, you can probably get uh, get it to like 30-ish minutes. So how did, I, I want the story here. How did you end up playing Bento Box instead of your calling game? Oh, it was the last round of the calling. And I was like, hey, Clay, do you want some ELO? And he was like, eh, I don't care. And I was like, okay, I can see. And then let's play Bento Box. And I, was, oh, I, I took it out. It's like, hey, you want to play Bento Box instead? And I was like, sure, <laughs> what is this? And uh, I think he had a really good time. So I know that he did. Yeah, he's um, he's expressed how much he likes it. And I've, I've I played with him, I think I've played with him like once since then. And I know that he's like, he's talked about like wanting to build one and put it together. And yeah, he, he really, he really, really enjoyed it. I think everybody... Everybody that I know that has tried Bento Box has just been like, yeah, this is amazing. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you guys so, have done a great job. At the uh, at our Airbnb, Zane built it, Nia built it, you built it, and now it's spreading. <laughs> <laughs> so some of Zane's locals have tried building it as well, and then it seems like your yeah. locals are picking it up too. Yeah, yeah, I guess there was eight of us at the Airbnb. You designed it. And then of the seven of us, you got three of us to build it. So <laughs> that is... Uh, it's pretty value. It's pretty, pretty good. Rate. Good yeah. rate. Good conversion rate. <laughs> yeah, we'll slowly take over the world. We're, it's, a, it's our grand goal of selling off Crouching Tiger Majestics. <laughs> I was going to ask that. How many Crouching Tigers do you need for that bento box? We have 10 tokens per box, but I don't think you need that many. Uh, Oliver, well, you can attest. But the high, the, there was a high roll. France was playing a game against someone at, at the calling. It was after after uh, the event was done. The guy made, I think, 14 Crouching Tigers, and we needed more Tigers. So pretty good chance that you might, or there's a very small chance that you might need more than 10. But yeah. Just block out the Tiger Swipes. And you'll <laughs> yeah, out. just yeah, block out Tiger Swipes, and you won't need more than, like, six. So, but... If you wanted to build this cube max rarity for whatever reason, you need like 14 Marvel Crouching Tigers? Maybe. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, honestly, max rarity, maximum price bento box probably isn't that expensive comparatively. Ira? Cold foil Ira? Cold, is cold oh. foil Ira is expensive. That's true. That's yeah. true. Okay. Right. Just the tokens. Just need you know, expensive tokens. I think if you don't have cold foil Ira... Like the needles, probably the most expensive card. Uh, and maybe breaking or the, scales or the Kadachi. Oh, true, true, Kadachi. Yeah, typically tokens in this game are very expensive to max That's rarity true. out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would gold foil equipment be expensive? I'm not. I'm not sure. Yes. Oh yeah, gold foil equipment is gold very foil, expensive. The first fist. So, is that a thing? Yeah. Unfortunately. Oh. Yeah, it's from season one pro quest, I think. Oh. Okay, yeah, so I will, uh, pretty expensive <laughs> to max rarity this. I, w I will note that our goal with the Bentham Box is to get as cheap as possible. So we do have a $30 version that is published. And we plan on doing it for one of our stores later on. Like we just build a bunch of Bento Boxes and then people will buy in and then do the duplicate sealed or draft. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to test out a couple of event types and we'll see how popular it is. It's just like a casual thing. Yeah, I've suggested locally that we should do a bento box armory, but I don't think we have enough bento boxes yet. But but yeah, it's nice to know that they can be made so cheaply and and it's is really cool that you get to like it's such like a it's an experience you can repeat. It's not like you play it once and then all the cards are gone. Like you hang on to the cards and you get to keep playing it, which is really nice. Yeah, and that's one of the appeals of like having your own cube, right? You can just play limited whenever you want and it's pretty cheap. So, uh bento box is a distilled version of that where you don't even need eight friends you just need one friend hopefully and you can play limited that makes a lot of sense okay you've told us a lot about 
kind of the two different cubes. Um, is there anything else you wanted to touch on or mention about either one of them before we jump into a little bit about your your design process? We won't. I, I'm sure we won't be able to touch on everything, but just kind of broad strokes what that looks like. Yeah. Right now, I think Oliver is experimenting with a assassin and room blade cube, I believe. Edge Lord's an ass. <laughs> Sorry, that's just the cube name that I have right now. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was just gonna say Edge Lord Cube. I, I can use that on the on the on the podcast, right? If it's family friendly, no. But if you want, sure. <laughs> and I've thought about a Ranger Bento box. I haven't tested it yet, but I think it might be okay. Uh, but... I have thought about it, and it doesn't work because it goes to fatigue. And what do you do then? I ha- have dominate. Uh, yeah, and then we need kind of like the legendary quiver, which kind of ruins the price point. So. Uh, but yeah, we've 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 done some experiments, but I encourage anybody who finds these ideas of these draft formats intriguing, not to just copy us. Um, not to saying not saying you, sh- you can't copy us, but I think you'll find it more fulfilling if you build your own, which is what we're going to kind of help you go into by talking about how our design process for cubes go. Yeah. Also, like Taylor from Attack Action Podcast has been trying to get an assassin cube working as well for the bento box. So there are oh. different flavors out there. That's really cool. I didn't I didn't know that Taylor was working on that. Okay. So kind of guide us through this. What is what is the starting point for your cube? Has it started from the heroes or or is there something else that you're looking at before you're even deciding the heroes when you're when you're coming up with like the initial plans for the cube? What most people do when they come up with ideas for cubes is that they focus on a couple of interactions, whether it's between heroes or between specific cards, and they're like, huh, that sounds kind of fun. And they start building up a environment to create these sorts of interactions. So with Midwinter Cube, I remember we were talking about this with you, you, Yuki. We wanted to shine a spotlight on heroes that weren't played at the time, which were Azalea and Kano, and see if we could, you know, build a interesting environment with them. So our initial drafts with Midwinter started with, okay, well we have Azalea here, we have Kano here. How can we make these heroes overlap and have you know interesting draft environments? And uh, we figured, well, there's Ice Ranger and Ice Wizard, so we can have Ice as a third kind of archetype to draft for, and have that these sorts of drafting dilemmas where you have to choose: Do I want to draft Ranger cards? If so, I can go to Ranger into like Azalea and Lexi. Do I want to draft Wizard cards? I can go into Kano and Icelander. Or do I want to draft ice cards? I can go into Lexi and Icelander. And so once you start mapping out these heroes and where they sit in terms of how you want to draft them, then you can start building an environment and start thinking like, okay, well, Ranger and, or, or, sorry, Azalea and Lexi. Um, Lexi can play every card that Azalea can play. So we need to figure out a way to encourage players to play Azalea. And you'll start you know, thinking about how these how they encourage specific heroes. And that's kind of how the cube starts, where we have the general map of the draft, and then you start figuring out how to solve each individual problem on this map to make sure that people want to play each individual hero. So when you mention having like a map for the cube, is that is that an idea of like, like, are you actually laying out like, Here's Azalea cards, here's Lexi cards, here's like, I guess like Ranger cards, that's both? Or or like, how, how are you doing that? Yeah, so I wrote an article a couple years back about how Flesh and Blood draft, draft formats work where you have different pools of cards and each combination of pools will net you a different hero at the very end. And so I encourage people to read that article, not because I wrote it, but because it's an interesting way to think about how these draft formats are set up so that you can apply them and create your own. And you can create an environment that is both interesting and is enticing for a lot of players. You don't want to end up with a environment like Uprising where it's like, well, I can draft Icelander and I can just be stuck in Icelander or I can draft Draconic cards and be stuck in Phi slash Dromai. I can't really pivot between them too easily. Right, so so the idea, I guess the article kind of looks at like the way that they're structured to have enough overlap that you feel like um, some of the cards are shared? Is that, is that kind of... Exactly, yeah. You'll 
you'll get these a lot in formats where the the heroes already share you know a couple um, already share a format so like arcane rising has azalea and Kano, and a lot of their generics are top deck related generics so you can start off with that with that as a base but for other heroes that don't share a format a existing set you have to kind of figure it out yourself right and and how important so so it sounds like you think that that like overlap is pretty important then or do you think that it's sort of optional or? i would say it's fairly important it's gonna be because most of the time um when you're drafting you're gonna be drafting cards from your hero but until you decide on what hero you're gonna play you have to figure out what's the best pick if i want to stay open and giving options for players who stay open is a really important part of making a draft format interesting because otherwise people just pick a lane and hope that nobody else has picked that lane okay so you kind of have the map and the general heroes and sort of like allocate cards to each slot from there are you thinking about like specific archetypes because like i know in bento box for example like like the tiger like the tiger archetype uh the the tiger crouching tiger combo archetype kind of like stands out as like its own distinct thing so is that something that you're like always looking at or does it sort of depend um how how are those archetypes getting fleshed out so that you can kind of potentially draft the hero in more than one way uh i'll let oliver um discuss this a little bit more but generally how i work it out is that I identify my mechanical themes that are good overlap points. And then I just let Oliver know like, hey, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to do. And then Oliver comes up with a list. So I don't know how Oliver exactly does it. He can probably explain. So for the Bento box, it was a little bit more uh, like, what is Katsu good at? And what is Ira good at? Ira is good at mid-range control, kind of like those grindy matchups. Because I played a lot of Ira back in like 2021 ish. So I knew how to build that. So I look at all the like the CC decks and then I just try to dumb it down essentially. Crashing Tiger came in because I didn't want to add more combo lines. Because the more combo lines uh, that are added, the more complex uh, drafting becomes and the less or the more watered down it becomes if enough hate drafting is happening. So I put in the Crashing Tiger line. Because it was it synergized Ira's ability somewhat, like flex claws into on hit into crouching tiger. You can get the plus one on Ira's ability, but also we had a few key cards in the cube that were already that already synergized with crouching tiger, like stubbies, the little sometimes depending on like kind of deck you're building. Uh, then we also had headley's a tail. Headley's a tail was pretty new for outsiders. Um, I also wanted to try it out with the crouching tigers, so. I just stuck a bunch of Crash and Tiger stuff in and hope for the best, honestly. <laughs> and it seems to have worked out. The The combo lines that I stuck with were the Surgeon Strike line and the Spinning Wheel Kick line. I wanted to lean heavily onto the Surgeon Strike line because uh, there's already two paths for it now with the Whelming Gust Wave and the Descending Gust Wave. And the Be Like Water also factored in, into it a lot because it can become Twin Twisters or Surgeon Strike. So... Uh, I just didn't want to deviate too much from the surging strike line because otherwise you would just have too many combo lines and it wouldn't be e- as easy to pick up, if that makes sense. Uh, I was going to say, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that kind of the big takeaway that I'm getting from that is that you want, it sounds like you kind of want some redundancy in your card so that it's not like if you miss, I don't know, like the one surging strike or or maybe even like you miss like the one like gust wave and then you have like surging strike and bonds and you can't connect them that would be like that'd be kind of a disaster so it sounds like you want like a few different cards that kind of fill in different parts of what that hero is looking yep. for and that's actually where mask of many faces comes in this is actually probably like the savior of our cube because uh we have it as a token which allows both heroes to play it and that allows us to put in a few fancy combo cards like uh pounding gale i have named Open a Center into Pounding Gale a couple of times. There's a Winds of Eternity as a combo ender. It's a zero for four as a blue. So it's uh, just some cute things you can do. Plus it adds consistency to the decks. Yeah. And I think in general, when you want to build out archetypes, Flesh and Blood is a different game from a lot of other card games where the cards in your deck individually, they don't do too much. Even the best cards in your deck are just like parts of an engine. So... 
when you create a limited environment, you have to make sure that you have enough opportunities for players to pick up every part they need for their engine. And so with, um, we mentioned this with a uh, bento box, but I think it also applies to midwinter cube where you have an idea of what Icelander wants, which is just ice cards, um, some number of fuse cards, maybe, and blue cards that do things. So encouraging players to play Icelander is just having enough of those cards in those specific num- in those, you know, specific thresholds where players will want to play Icelander when they draft, you know, 20 something blues that are in wizard and making sure that players are feeling good about their choice and feel good when playing their decks is probably the most important part when making a draft environment. Sorry, that was kind of rambly, but hopefully it made sense. I, I think so. Like you, you want people to be having fun when they're playing their cards and you want it to be an enjoyable experience. I th- I think that makes a lot exactly. of sense. And when you're looking for inspirations, because you, you kind of both keep talking about like what these heroes want, is is that mostly, like Oliver kind of mentioned looking at CC deck lists, is that mostly coming from CC or are there other areas of inspiration you're drawing on for these like hero, I don't know, outlines? So there, I'll, I'll, I'll mention, I'll cut Oliver off really quick and I'll say that our first experiment with Midwinter Cube involved me saying, I want to play Moonkiss and Sunwish <laughs> and forcing Oliver to add like a bunch of copies of Moonwish and a bunch of copies of Sunkiss in the hopes that somehow the deck would come together. Um, it didn't. And I think in the last iteration of the cube, we have completely removed all copies of that. So, <laughs> so in general, like inspiration can come from a lot of places, but for a lot of heroes, it's just like, I want to see what I can do and encourage people to experiment and see what they can come up with. I have a question about the bento box for uh, just like card choices. Have you guys this or not decided? But yeah. have you guys tried or thought about putting life for a party in that cube? It's is that it's not too good? Cute, I think because you, what you want to do is mask many faces, crazy brew into life of the party. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a little too cute. We, we've talked about it before, and we're like, hmm, we can do this. But I think the thing is that. Life of the Party doesn't really add much to the cube itself, so we haven't really added it. Bento Box is actually pretty tight, where we don't have too many slots that we can just like dedicate for fun cards, because the driving philosophy behind it is that every card should be useful in some scenario. And it's, it is balanced around Duplicate Sealed, which was the original intention. People just play a draft because it's easier. So I just want to ask, for, so can you explain Duplicate Sealed just a little bit? more i'm just not grasping it fully yeah yeah so uh sorry i didn't actually explain this so duplicate sealed was a format back in magic the gathering um it was in the 1990s and early 2000s where they had a bunch of pros come in and they gave them a bunch of sealed pools that contained completely new cards or completely rebalanced cards they didn't understand how they worked and didn't they hadn't played before and the goal was that all these other pros had the exact same pool. So you have to build a deck that can beat their decks given the same pool. And so it was a format that really rewarded rapidly being able to understand and adapt to what your opponent was doing. And that's kind of what we made Bento Box for. It was a set of 90 cards. Your opponent has the same set of 90 cards. So you have two Bento Boxes and you build a seal deck and you try and guess what your opponent is playing so that you can play cards that beat them or just you know outplay them. So a lot of the cards in the bento box have that philosophy where if your opponent is playing X, you can play Y and you will probably be in a better position than they are. So a lot of those uh, those interactions lend itself natu- naturally to like hate drafting and drafting. So it turns out that when you're doing a two player draft with the sing- with a single bento box, it's still a pretty deep format. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. I I do recognize or I do remember on Magic Arena recently they had a sealed format where everyone had the same pool, uh, and that was like yeah too many cards I think, but yeah they did that one. So it's less interesting when you have more players in the same pool because then you just go with whatever you assume most players are playing and play the opposite of that. But if you only have like ten or so players that are like invited to this format and you know all the other nine players, then you can guess, okay, well, this guy is probably going to play this because that's what he's comfortable with. 
this guy's probably going to play this, this person's probably going to play this, so on and so forth. And so that level of metagaming is what I live for. I see, I see. That's Honestly, that makes me want to build my own bento cube too then. Bento box. Yeah, then we can battle, Jay. I probably have all the cards. <laughs> yeah, except use a rapid reflex instead of razor reflex. Otherwise, Yuki's, Yuki's uh, box is better. Which which card is rapid reflex? Is it the red from Uprising? Yes. It is red yeah, or yellow. Like three block, one cost. Give a ninja attack plus three. Uh, a cost right? zero attack. A cost zero attack. Plus it's three. almost strictly worse razor reflex except it blocks three. I come from an era where I thought blocking was the shit. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to swear if it's a family friendly show, but um, okay. I, uh, I really like blocking in Flesh and Blood. And I come from an era where everything was pretty mid rangey and blocking was good. Um, nowadays, it's just like sometimes it's a uh, vomit hand if it's uh, the correct matchup, but there should be enough disruption nowadays that you can't do that anymore. Uh, so that's why I kind of liked Raptor Reflex in the cube because mm. it blocks three and also deals three damage now. So I, ju- I just like that trade off or like thinking where is it best. That makes a lot of sense. And maybe that kind of segues nice into uh, one of the last questions that I had prepared for you guys. That was, um, so when you're deciding on these cards, uh, it's it sounds like it sounds like there's like a conscious decision about power level. And you guys mentioned some of that being to do with cost. But do you, do you think that there's sort of like a sweet spot in terms of power level or... You know, how can, can you maybe speak more to that? Like, are you specifically designing for like a certain kind of a power level or is it really mostly the, the cost um, aspect that's sort of making you have the power level that you have in Bento? I'll take this one. The See, I don't really consider um, high cost cards to be particularly over the line in terms of power level. I mean, sure, there's C and C, um, but Tunic isn't actually that great. And like you have Crown of Providence, which is okay, but it's not much of a power bump. So a lot of the power in Flesh and Blood comes instead from the consistency of a deck rather than the actual power level of a deck. You have a lot of what people think of as power cards that are only really as good as the cards around them, right? You can't really... Blood Rush Bellow isn't that great if you don't have Scapskins and if you don't have Mandible Claws. Three of a kind isn't that great if you're drawing garbage arrows, right? And Codex of Frailty is still good, but if you're not if you're getting back like scour the battlescape instead of leave no witnesses, it's not that much of a power. Yeah, bump. well, Co- Codex I think is just the one outlier outlier in that one where it gives minus power to your opponent's card. You draw a card and you get that card, so it's still pretty powerful. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's still it's still strong. But it's like yeah. you get you get two cards even if they're bad <laughs> cards. Yeah, it, it's it's still <laughs> strong. It's not it's just not like amazingly. Oh my god, this is unbeatable, right? So when people think about power level, and we when, when we think about power level, we mostly think about consistency of decks. If a deck is performing too consistently, or if they're doing what they want to do too consistently compared to other heroes, that's usually when we say, okay, we should probably reduce the power of some cards so that they are less consistent. Um, So it's not necessarily a choice of um, budget, but more of a choice of, uh, we want to make sure that all decks are on on an even playing level, and we we want to make sure that these weirder archetypes get a chance to shine. And usually what that means is that for the best cards, we just have to reduce the consistency of how good they are. So you can uh, Oliver can probably attest, we've done a ton, a ton of swaps that are just like, okay, we'll exchange this red one with a yellow one. Or we'll exchange this blue with a slightly better blue so that the consistency of the end result is slightly better. Do you more or less agree with that, Oliver? Or do you have anything else to add to that? Or Yeah, so actually our very first playtest the midwinter cube i made a uh, wizard too efficient too consistent uh so like icelander had plenty of blues to work with ranger uh, did not have enough damage output so that's when i started changing some yellows to reds and then that's when i started changing some blues to reds so it helped ranger in that sense but then also it reduced the effectiveness of wizard if you look at our spreadsheet you can see like the changes that we did over the uh, the playtests, and 
yeah, you, you can see evidence of that. Yeah, a lot of our changes that came from Midwinter Cube comes from just, okay, we noticed this hero is performing well even when people are drafting it more than usual. So that means it's too easy to put together a deck, which means it's probably a little bit on the stronger side or there's some other problem with the cube that we should probably probably resolve. Uh, one example is our most recent playtest. We had, I think, five people drafting Ranger, and most of them were like, yeah, I should have played Azalea, but I just wanted to play Lexi uh, because I have these good ice and these good you know lightning cards. And what ended up happening was that we figured, one, we made Ranger a little bit too powerful, and two, it's too easy to pick up buffs as Ranger so that people were drafting not too many arrows and just a bunch of generic cards and buffs, and we're still doing very well. So there's a lot of like tiny knobs that we tweak to adjust power level, but we don't really consider it power level so much as the consistency of decks. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Maybe to close things out here, we did. I did ask on Twitter, I mentioned that we were going to have you on, and some people were pretty excited. A few of them had questions that they were hoping to get answered. Um, so maybe you can speak to these. There was just two listener questions. So I do not know how to say this name. <laughs> I, I have no idea either. <laughs> C- C- Criv Norixius? I- I'm sure that I said that wrong. Anyways, th- I apologize. This person asks, um, I'm making a fab cube, but how do you convince people that it's fun and overcome the first impression that cube, draft, or sealed is complicated? Um, and they specifically give the example of drafting equipment. So have you had, yeah, have you had any trouble getting people on board or what does your onboarding process look like to kind of get people to try it out and understand that it's fun and it's not too intimidating? Yeah. I think we're blessed to have locals that are both familiar with cube and have, and are interested in playing it. So locally we haven't had too many issues getting people together, but as somebody who has a lot of magic cubes, I definitely can empathize, empathize, empathize with you in that it's really hard to get a people together consistently. Uh, Honestly, the best advice is that accept that you'll be doing a lot of work. Uh, you will have to make the onboarding process as easy as possible. So you will need to be able to come up with a good hook for your cube. Like for midwinter cube, it's it's a fab cube. Um, but you know, assuming that later on it, fab cubes become more prevalent and become more commonplace, the draw would be: well, you want to if you want to play Azalea, you want to play Kano, you can play it play it as cube, and it's actually pretty fun, and you can actually win with it, <laughs> win with them, um, specifically Kano nowadays. But yeah, it's it's just a lot of marketing and a lot of people who are just willing to take the risk. Um, I wouldn't expect you to get too many takers if you're just asking your locals. But I think the best option is just to just ask around your locals like, hey, if you guys wanted to do a cube, you want to do a cube some night or you want to meet up for a cube night or something. And you'll get people who are interested in people nodding their heads occasionally. But you have to go out of your way to start do all the planning, do all the, you know, pack preparations, make make it as easy as possible for people to get into cube. And once they're in and they know how fun it is, that's when you hopefully can get them for a second round. Yep. Yeah, I usually handle all that stuff. So I just invite people over uh, and then we just like order food and then we just hang out and chill. Ooh, yeah, a lot of it's like being a DM. That's a good piece of advice. You can bribe them with food. You go free food if you come cube. <laughs> I, feel, yeah. I feel targeted, Yuki. <laughs> Uh, one of our locals literally just did that to me last week they're just like right before the rtn they're like i want to do one more draft and they're just like i'm gonna make food so you should come and i'm like okay okay if there's food i will come (laughs) also like gonna tap onto like the fact that People might think that cube or limited for fab is complicated where you have to draft equipment. This cube is 15 picks per pack. Uh, the recent sets have been 14 picks per pack. 15 picks per pack with a lot of playables lends itself to having very like decent decks after you're done. Uh, I recently invited one of our friends who hasn't ever played fab limited before. So he didn't know, like, uh, so he had learned how to draft equipment and he went 2-1 in the cube. So 
it's up to you, I think, to make the cube good enough that you don't need to draft the equipment, but also uh, provide a, like, a good experience without having to draft equipment, that is. Yeah, and I really hate this advice because I never like the advice when it's given to me. But honestly, just have confidence when you're trying to sell your cube and just be pushy about it. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. And, you know, if you have a smaller locals or less buy-in, you could always start with, maybe start with the bento box. And it's, it's a lot easier to convince like one or two people, you know, get two people to play each other and you can hang out and watch them. And that might be like a basis for your bigger cubes later on. Also, I was going to say like, if you ever go out to like callings and stuff, you can probably find people that are interested in playing cube. If like the number of people is your problem. And if you have a cube, if you bring it to a calling, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a bunch of people that would want to play. Um, you, you will need to either talk to people you don't know, or like, you know, if you message probably like myself, I'll definitely play cube if there's some downtime during events or something like that. But yeah, I think that's a good way to like get people who are interested in cube to gather around pretty quickly. Yeah, I think like Discord or social media would be a great way to advertise that to you at an event. Oh, and one other trick that some people might not be able to do is it's really easy to get people to cube if it's the format that you're playing your weekly fab night for. <laughs> so uh, if you have like a play anywhere event that, you know, is just like we just want people to gather up and hang out. Just ask your TO to say like, hey, I want to play cube. Can we just play our cube for this one night? And hopefully people will show up. It's not a bad idea. Yeah. We do have one other listener question here that I'd like to get to. So this is from Similar Taste. And they ask, are there any plans or ideas you've had to approach tailored, very high power cubes? What are the cubes that are designed... Uh, sorry, what about cubes that are designed to blend in alternative formats, not only such as commoner, but shapeshifters? I think they're asking, you, you can take that how you will. I, I kind of take it as they're asking about, like, have you thought about maybe shapeshifter or like going for like very high powered cubes? Kind of kind of like what we see in Magic, where you have these like super, super powerful cubes. Yeah, I think a lot of people's perception of cube is, I wouldn't say tainted, but it's influenced by mtgo's vintage cube which is just high power cards the best cards in the game throw it all in a melting pot and make a deck out of them i think that approach to fab only will work if you have a shapeshifter cube so if you want to do a quote-unquote high power cube a lot of the high power decks in fab's past haven't actually had too many high power cards like you have starvo right but like 70 percent of the cards they played were garbage they're just like random X, a block for two elemental stuff that just like were there to activate Starvo. Uh, chains cards are garbage if you can't play Chain, right? You can't play like Riftbind. Riftbind kind of sucks, and there's a bunch of other stuff. So when you want to design a Shapeshifter cube, you just want to have a high power environment that is has a bunch of archetypes that you want to play. If I were to design a high power cube in that fashion, what I would do is I'd probably just choose all of the heroes that can be chosen for the shapeshifter cube first, and then all of the weapons, and then just be like, okay, if I want to draft this hero and this weapon together, what does that deck want to look like? And just throw cards in there that will entice people to say like, okay, well, I want to, I want to play this deck now. Um, I think that's how you would want to approach a shapeshifter, shapeshifter cube. Just You still want to make it archetype-based, but you can be a little bit more freeform with how you design archetypes because you can play any card in the deck. Yeah, I think that's some good advice that just because it's high-powered and just because you can play anything, if you have certain cards that work together, it's probably a lot more interesting than if it's just like a soup of cards. Yeah, now that I think about it, I guess it doesn't really make sense to do shapeshifter cube because... As you said, like the most powerful decks in the game, basically super cohesive decks that like, like Chain, where all their cards is absolutely terrible, but so like they're not really fit for limited. And then it's only good if you get all of them together, but then then you don't really have any choices during the draft portion, which should be the one of the most interesting parts about Cube, right? I think when you, if you're going to design shape for the Cube, you still have to design it around heroes and around deck, around like weapons. But you can just, you know, come up with some wild stuff and try and encourage that that way. Like maybe you have Life of the Parties and three Crazy Brews and like a couple of knickknacks 
And you're just like, okay, well, I can make a deck from this. Let's try and draft it. Uh, and, you know, just go crazy from there. The one that I always keep coming back to whenever I think about Shapeshifter is I just want to do Viscerai with Merciful Retribution so that all your rune chants ping to Arcane. <laughs> yeah, and you can probably design a couple of good decks around that, right? You can do like some weird looming Doom stuff with Merciful and then add like Seismic Stirs. Oh, Ooh. Skeleta to be able to pop off on some like crippling crush. Skeleta, Skeleta pulverize. Yeah. Or, <laughs> I don't know, Ice Eternal yourself for five frostbites. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do, but you just gotta figure out what pieces you need and just throw them in and hopefully they can identify the pieces. And I, I do think you have some work to do in terms of like what exactly the shapeshifter cube looks like like can people pick their heroes before do you pick after like how how does that work and what are all the parameters on that but um but yeah it does it does sound interesting um maybe something that will get explored one day for 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 um cubes with alternative formats just go crazy don't tie yourself down to what you think fab is and just as long as it works within the confines of your cube and you explain that to players beforehand it's not like completely nonsensical people will like it and people will try it and be like okay let's try this out and see how it goes yeah and we definitely broke some rules for regular fab playing like we have mask of many faces as a token for bento box and then we have northern robe as a token for the midwinter cube you just bend the rules to make it work and i think both of those are net positives for that environment that you wouldn't really consider otherwise that that makes a lot of sense. I think that pretty much wraps up what we have in terms of listener questions. Anything else cube related you two want to touch on before we before we sign off here? If you're building your own cube, good luck. Go crazy. I'm interested in seeing what other people come up with. Uh, I've played around a bunch with uh, other stuff, but I've never really. I'm not really one to put pen to paper too often. Uh, so if you guys have a cool idea, go for it. I'm interested in seeing what people come up with. Yeah, I think Cube is such an awesome thing to share. So, you know, just uh, if you ever share your list or whatever you've been working on, I think a lot of people would be excited to see that. All right, great. And if people want to hear more from you guys or consume more of your content, um, we'll have a link to some of it in the description. But um, what are, where where can people find you or engage with you? Is it mostly through your YouTube channel? Or are there any other places people can find your work yes youtube channel uh we don't have social media because yes <laughs> <laughs> um okay you can find me on discord uh i guess you just ping me like i mentioned um you can also i guess message me on reddit people have done that before because i usually post my articles on reddit i guess you can message me on the judge judge blog uh i kind of manage the judge blog for flesh of blood so if you really want to get in t- contact with me you can leave a comment there i guess don't do that though <laughs> i have no clue um yeah just ping me on discord or ping me on reddit um or just email me okay so so that's mal zenith yep. on all platforms yes. okay perfect all right thanks so much for coming on oliver and yichin um this was an awesome episode it was really fun to get to talk to you about kind of cube and what goes into designing that and uh hopefully some of our listeners can try out cube for themselves if you are listening and you end up trying out cube let us know what your thoughts are down in the comments below until next time i hope everyone has a good night that's all for today thank Thank you you for having us goodbye see ya okay and uh before we close the the actual recording uh-huh. typically yuki and i talk about anything that's not fab related um i just have a question for you guys you guys said you guys sure. have a bunch of magic cubes which ones do you guys have or which what, what kind Ooh. of magic cubes do you guys Ooh, have okay. it sounds like you don't have vintage cube right okay so i have five quote-unquote <laughs> traditional cubes five um, yeah wow. uh, 1.5 battle boxes and 1.5 how do you have 0.5 of a bottle uh, box? I, it's not finished yet i need to get the chocolate bands. Oh, okay okay um and like two not exactly cube cubes um so i'll go for, uh i'll go over my traditional cubes which are mostly draft sims i have a draft sim of innistrad 
uh, of Theros Block, of Ultimate Masters, and of Modern Horizons 1. Um, I also have a normal cube that I use for onboarding people onto Magic. Uh, for battle boxes, I have uh, 1.5 historical standard boxes. So historical standard is basically just like I take eight standard decks from a certain era and then jam them together. And they, they're just ready to play out, out of the box. So I have one from Onslaught to Odyssey. And then one from Kamigawa to Ravnica. Um, and the Kamigawa to Ravnica one, I just haven't built all of it yet because shock lines are expensive. That's that's totally fair. That's totally fair. Yeah. Um, and then for non-traditional cubes, I have one that is custom sleeves. How it works is that you draft your cube, which is just a super generic like corset to your cube. And then at the very end, you draft inner sleeves. On these inner sleeves are additional abilities and additional costs. So, for example, um, one sleeve I have, for example, would be a... It adds the word cheap to the name of a card, and it's just minus two cost, and then minus one, minus one for attack and defense, attack, um, you know, power and toughness. Uh, oh, so the card gets cheaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically what you do is you draft these like random junk cards, and then you make them better by drafting the sleeves for them. Oh, oh my goodness. That sounds so fun. So... It sounds so weird. so like you've actually written on sleeves. No, no, no. So you know the guy who does altar sleeves. Do you know what altar sleeves are? No. So altar sleeves <laughs> were a experiment a couple years ago where some guy was like, "I want altered cards, but I don't want to like pay alterers." So what he did was he paid a bunch of alterers to design sleeves where they just go over a, a card on an inner sleeve and it looks like it's altered. Basically, he found a way to print oh. on inner sleeves. So I was like, wait a second. I can." I came up with the idea first. And I was like, wait a second. I can just email this guy and see if he's willing to do it. And he's like, yeah, I'll do a, a one-off set of 300 sleeves, 300 different designs, and I'll just like provide him the, the graphics, and then he can make them, and he prints them, and I have them. <laughs> that sounds so cool. So you're the only person that has, has yeah. access to this? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Yi Chen. You need to bring that next okay. time, and we can play it. <laughs> oh, dude, I, I want to play it, too. Where, where are you going to... U.S. Nationals? Yeah, probably. U.S. Nationals. I guess I'm going to U.S. Nationals just to play this? <laughs> Does that Sounds... mean... Well, you can also play Fab. Are we going to all room together again? I don't yeah. know. I haven't, I haven't booked a hotel yet. Yeah. If he wants to, at least. Oh. Otherwise, he can come over and hang out. I Whatever can probably do that. I don't know. With. We ha- we have a I have a timeshare um, in Vegas. I can probably bum off of. Ooh. Yeah, Yuki wants to host the, the Street Waffle Airbnb again. So. Uh, okay. Sounds yeah, good. that'd be awesome, and we can probably have room for a few people. Like, because we had extra people last time too. We had like Isaac join us and Seb. Mm-hmm. So. I'm sure we could have like Jay and Yichen. I don't see why. Well, I you should know, Yuki. I never take up space in these things. <laughs> it's true. Jay will be sleeping like in a closet somewhere um, or something. First time I was in Vegas for a magic event, I slept on the in the bathtub. So, <laughs> oh, I, I've done I've done way weirder. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, so my other cube, my other <laughs> weird cube is just a draft your own lands cube, um, and every land is either a pain land or like a um a like colorless land so it's just a super punishing super unfun cube that i did as like an art piece <laughs> is it playable oh my gosh. uh it is theoretically playable i have not played it yet <laughs> but is it, so it's just lands no, no 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 it's like an actual cube um have you ever seen desert cube no. So Desert Cube is a cube where it's like the whole setting is like you're on a desert world and you have to draft your own basics because there's not enough resources to go around. Uh, I took ba- that idea and turned it up to 11, basically. I see. <laughs> I see. I see. So I guess you don't get any basics to build your deck. You just you have get, to draft you, get, you, have, you have basic wastes. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but Desert Cube, you don't actually, can, you can't actually 
you know, you don't have basics, so you just have to draft your basics. Hmm. Gotcha. Interesting. Huh, I see. That's so weird. Yeah. Like for myself, I just have a, a Yu-Gi-Oh cube. It's like not mm-hmm. exactly done yet, but essentially it's just a location to put all of my high rarity Yu-Gi-Oh cards and then not Dude, feel bad that Yu-Gi-Oh I have all these high rarity cards. I, I'm I'm experimenting with making a Pokemon cube. <laughs> Well, Pokemon cubes are very fun. I've played a couple of Pokemon cubes, and as long as the power level is not too high, and I feel like the double prize Pokemons are bad for cube, but other than that, it's pretty fun. Yeah, I'm worried about that. Um, I don't want to do. I don't want. I want to break Singleton for these ones and just make like an interesting environment. But I don't know enough about Pokemon to be confident in what I'm doing, basically. I see, I see. Well, nobody plays limited in Pokemon, so no matter yeah. what you do, it'll be okay. I figure. But I don't want <laughs> I want it to be like a comparable experience to at least like Magic Cube, right? Mm, yeah, then you'd need duplicates. Oh the thing with Pokemon though is that there's so many duplicate abilities on different names, you could probably do all singleton, but with very similar effects. Yeah. I'm my thoughts are I just do like original 150 and like cobble together a few archetypes from that. And I think I have like a good base of it where I have like a couple of interesting archetypes where you just focus on like three or four um, types and have the other types as like supporting types. But I haven't gotten super far with it. Mm, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. A couple of my friends also like are building something like buddy fight cube. I know one of my friends has a, a Weiss Schwartz cube, which is Honestly, one of my favorite cubes. Oh, interesting. Twice is so fun. Yeah, basically every game I play, I'm just like, can I make this into a cube? Probably. Yeah, every game you can make. You can <laughs> you can build a cube yeah. for every game. I know because yeah. I play a, a bunch of different games. And basically for every game, somebody that I know will design a cube and I'll play with them. Mm-hmm. Nice. Okay, um, I think that should be good. Anything else you guys want to say right before I close out? Uh, no, that's about it. All right, perfect. And yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for coming on to our show. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Mm-hmm.